Welcome to Business Edge Radio, the show that gives you tips, tricks, tools, and techniques about how to build a more profitable business, while at the same time creating your perfect lifestyle. It's a show about working less and living more. A few golden nuggets, a little bit of wisdom, and over 35 years of business experience to help you keep your edge. Lifestyle entrepreneur, best-selling author, internationally renowned business speaker, and daddy of three, Mitch Graff brings the heat with actionable techniques for building the business and lifestyle of your dreams. Now your host, Mitch Graff. Well, good day, Unleashed Tribe, and welcome to another jam-packed edition of Business Edge Radio, the ultimate brainstorming session for your business and your life. I'm your host, Mitch Graff, and on today's show, we're going to be talking a lot about a thing called happiness. I'm also reviewing a book called, wait for it, Happiness by a Buddhist monk. I share some good, bad, and ugly stories of customer service. We get into my mailbag. Plus, I will share with you a delicious recipe for fresh and zesty mango salsa that you will want to eat with chips and on crackers, on top of your chicken, and even by the spoonful. Hitting the launch button on anything new is an extremely scary thing. A new hairdo, a new pair of glasses, a never tried before recipe, a brand new job, a new business. It can freeze you dead in your tracks and cause you to stay up at night worrying, but can also introduce you to entire new worlds if you have the gumption to try. We are afraid of the unknown. However, there is nothing truly unknown anymore. Can you imagine living just a mere 100 years ago and trying to find a job during the Great Depression? Same set of challenges, same anxieties. Those people were leaving their villages and towns where they were able to provide for themselves and headed into the great unknown, into these big and scary cities that none of them had had a chance to explore prior to them leaving. There, only money could bring food on the table. The alternative was giving up and returning to poverty and borderline famine. All they were doing is trying to find their own happy. Luckily for us today, these brave men and women ignored their primordial fears and made that decisive leap that ultimately created the world that we know. Therefore, the only thing standing between you and your success is inherited laziness and the fear of failure. You share both with every single human being on this planet. There's no such thing as being predisposed for success because success isn't given. It's a result of planned and executed series of steps that lead to the ultimate goal, which is absolute time freedom and financial freedom. I call it the new 24-7 mentality. The only way to reach that goal is to become an entrepreneur. Are there any guarantees? Yes. Contrary to general consensus, and like a gazillion blogs and books that paint the picture of uncertainty, the success is guaranteed if you invest yourself into it. After all, We're talking about offering your products or services to a 4 billion person strong market. Half of them are shopping online, which makes it an incredibly easy thing to connect with them. Today, more than ever before throughout our history, it has become increasingly easy to start and run your own show because unlike back then, this massive market is well within your reach. You don't even have to leave your home in some instances. There's this rising corpus of new age entrepreneurs who are making money in their pajamas. We're talking about online entrepreneurs and freelance service providers who are rewriting the employment paradigm as we speak. Because of them, the work is not where you go anymore, but it's what you do. And without exceptions, they are considered entrepreneurs or side hustlers because they are in total control of their market, their time, and their income. And of course, their level of contentment just like you can be if you decide to take that simple leap of faith. The best part about it is you don't have to have the faith in someone else's ability to keep the company running so you can receive your paycheck. The only person you have to have faith in is you and you alone. Admit it, it is easier to believe in yourself than to willingly put your life and your future in someone else's hands, isn't it? So what is the very first step in the new 24-7 paradigm? meaning to figure out a way to get your work done so efficiently that you only need to work 24 hours a week, seven months a year, with the rest of the time off to do whatever you want. That first step, 
export everything, and I do mean everything, that's now swirling around in that brain of yours, stick it on paper so you can visualize it. Don't even bother with the order of things, just let it start flowing out. Your ideas, your goals, your dreams, I don't care how far-fetched and crazy some of these ideas might seem to you now, just write it all down on a piece of paper. Things you've wanted to do, goals you've stuck in the back burner for far too long, and as soon as it's written down, that is the moment when a daydream starts transforming into a new reality because it's not just a wave anymore, but a tangible physical shape. I want to give you an example in my own life of putting a goal on the back burner for so long. I'm talking a long time. Back in the 90s, I used to play a lot of guitar and wrote a lot of songs about lost love and found love and feeling happy and just life. For a while, I even sent demos to Nashville trying to get my song sold. I did have one song put on hold by the production company for the band Alabama. And what on hold means is that you can't sell the song to anybody else for six months. They don't give you any money for it, but they did want to take the song into the studio along with a vast plethora of other songs that they were considering for their next album. Pretty cool stuff. So after six months, they informed me that my song would not be on the upcoming album, and I was back at square one. Well, then life happened, and before I knew it, 25 years had passed, and my songs just sat in a box, gathering dust for all that time. I had a goal back then of someday making an album of songs that I had written, just so I can say I did it, and to give my kids something to show their children when they grew up. Plus, in the back of my mind, I've always felt that several of my songs could easily be on the radio, performed by a band or an artist that we all know and love. <laughs> well then, 2020 comes around and the world changed overnight. I lost my father in the middle of the pandemic, and my goals and dreams for what I wanted to do with the rest of my life came into hyper-focus. My family was already at the center of my universe, but not like they are now. So I hired the best vocalist I could find, the best engineer. I went into the studio, recorded my first <laughs> and last <laughs> album. 25 years, no real reason why I didn't do it sooner than the lame excuse that life got in the way. I've always been huge on setting goals, working towards my goals and accomplishing goals, but for some reason, this one never got wings like my other dreams. Now that it's done, I can share my music with the world, and I ask myself why it took so long. What if something would have happened to me along the way, and the songs would have simply been words on a piece of paper for my kids to stick in the attic one day? What if? What if? Well, what's on your list of things that you have been procrastinating for a week, a year, your entire life? Are they important enough for you to start doing something about it? Or will they stay on that proverbial list of things that never get done? Tell me what these following numbers are. 1825 to 1877. 1976 to 1851. 1962 to 2020. Well, they are lifespans. There's a born on date and a dead on date. We have little control over either one of those events, but we do have control over what we do with the time in between. It's called the dash. It's everything that happens from the second you're born to the moment you die. It's your entire life boiled down into a minuscule little hyphen. The question I'd like you to marinate right now in your mind, how are you spending your dash? The dash is all we have that we leave behind when we're done on this earth. Are you making a difference in the lives of the people that mean the most to you? Living the life of an unleashed entrepreneur, or what I call a UE, means much more than running a successful business. It means living a life of meaning and purpose as well. Another way of describing the in-between segment of your life is the gap. Here's where you are today, and there's where you wanna be. And then there's the gap in between. We need to learn to love the gap because that's where most of our life is actually lived. Gap thinking will help you understand the importance of your dash. We all want to be better moms and dads and friends and bosses and workers. We want to live a life that is rewarding and fulfilling, yet success and happiness seems to elude many people. Many folks are stuck in jobs they despise, marriages that are broken, and other quagmires. We all need something to strive for, work towards, and dream about. What's your reason for getting up out of bed every day? If you can't come up with a better reason than, well, I gotta go to work? 
then it's time for you to take a good hard look at your life from 40,000 feet. If you were to ask a group of elderly people what they would do differently if they could live their life over again, in my experience, most answer that they would reflect more, risk more, and do more things that would live on after they were gone. The best part is we don't have to wait until our life is nearly over before we begin to live like this. We could begin today. There's nothing sadder to me than when someone doesn't give his or her life enough value, or when someone says, I didn't live my life like I should have. I didn't achieve. I didn't take any risks. There's no going back to the beginning of the race. When you go to sleep every night, it's one less day you have. Can you imagine getting up, going to work, and having to do things you don't like or you're not very good at? That's not the kind of thing that makes you want to get up every day with a spring in your step. But when you get up with a sense of purpose and you love what you do, it's going to bring your focus into a very narrow beam of high intensity energy bursting with very palpable results. What's holding you back from living the life of your dreams? What steps can you take today to make those dreams come true? I've noticed many people don't have a real sense of direction, almost as if they're waiting for someone to show them the way. You must make the choice to move forward with your life and not sit around waiting for the magic to happen from out of the blue. There's two kinds of people in the world. Those who wait for something to happen and those who take the initiative and make things happen. If you need to change, don't make any more excuses. And hoping that things will change has no effect. Only tangible actions on your part will make the difference. As we discuss in the show all the time, balancing work and life is a very delicate dance indeed. The challenge is to keep your perspective and discover or rediscover what's important to you. We never know when our time is up. Most people live like they're a bubblegum wrapper in a parking lot, meandering forever wherever the wind blows them. Today matters, so use it to make someone else's life better. If you want to make the most of your life and live it with enthusiasm and zeal, listening to this show is a good start, but it's only the beginning. You'll need to make some tough decisions along the way. Your approach to life may need to change. And as your approach changes, your attitude and the way you allocate your time will change as well. Any type of transformation requires a process of accepting change. We are constantly in process of becoming whatever it is we're meant to be. Stay determined, stay disciplined, and sooner than you think, you'll find yourself living your version of the 24-7 lifestyle and will be on the road less traveled. Mmm, cheese. If you like cheese as much as I do, then you probably have had the opportunity at some point in your life to visit a factory where they make cheese. One of my favorite places is the Tillamook Cheese Factory in Tillamook, Oregon. You walk in and are immediately overcome by the immensity and grandness of the building. If you want, you can take a guided tour behind the scenes to hear about the entire process from beginning to end. If you know anything about making cheese, you know it all starts with the milk from a cow. And if you've ever been to Tillamook, there's cows everywhere. From there, exact ingredients, temperatures, and aging are combined to give each type of cheese its distinctive flavor and texture. There's conveyor belts, there's cheese cutters, wrappers, boxers, stackers, loaders, and quality control personnel making sure that every single block of cheese meets rigorous standards. At the end, there's big boxes that are loaded onto a big truck and then carried away to the retail stores where you and I can go in, buy a big old hunk of cheese, and take it home to enjoy. They definitely have their systems down. Every step along the way is controlled by a process. And at the end of the process, a marvelous block of cheese is produced that tastes exactly like a block of cheese you bought at the store last week. However, if any part, any part of the system fails, the cheese doesn't make it into our bellies. Just like making a good block of cheese requires a specific process, you should have a well-planned system in place for selling your products and services. Step one is what we call the pre-sell. It's everything that you do before a prospective customer contacts you. It's your marketing, your networking, the professionalism of your marketing arsenal, your advertising, word of mouth, the irresistibility of your offers, your relationships with people throughout your community. All these things go into creating value for what you do. Together, they comprise the first step in creating an effective sales atmosphere. 
and people make judges about us within about five seconds after they are exposed to our voice, our signage, our business card, our physical appearance, our voicemails. That five seconds will either help build value for you or will take it away. And remember, perception is the reality. We all make decisions in our subconscious minds about what kind of value something has for our life and how much we are willing to spend for that value. If you want to be viewed as someone worth spending money on, every aspect of your brand must be top notch. The next step is the initial contact. And our initial contact with prospective customers usually occur on the phone these days. And I would venture to say that for most of you, taking phone calls is not your favorite thing to do. You didn't get into business of being an entrepreneur because you like talking on the phone, did you? However, this is the first real opportunity for you to sell yourself. Educate the prospect about what they can expect from you and begin to build that long-term relationship. Understanding that the telephone is one of the most important, if not the most important selling tool that you have will help you begin to look at it a little differently. After all, when a call comes into your business, that just means that your marketing has done its job and now it's time for the sales process to kick in. The first rule to follow is that you always want to be smiling and happy when you answer the phone, even if you're having a bad day. People can sense positive energy and negative vibes through the telephone, so take a deep breath before answering the phone and show your best side. We've all had bad days now and then, but you should never let that come across on the phone. As soon as the phone is answered, it's go time. The goal is to get them excited about you and the experience they are going to have. It doesn't matter what country you live in, whether you are in the far reaches of the earth or in downtown Metropolisville, we all get the same questions during that initial phone call. How much? <laughs> How much are you? How much is your blue widget? And since you know that 99% of all prospects are going to ask that question, wouldn't it make sense to have some sort of script figured out ahead of time instead of trying to spontaneously come up with an answer? And in many cases, your answers may be questions, questions that help you better understand the prospect's needs. After all, people ask about price because they don't know what else to ask. What they really want to know is whether you are the right business for them, whether you sell products or whether you sell services. Are you going to be able to meet their needs? That's what they really want to know. But the only question they can think of is, how much? <laughs> Imagine if you walked into a friend's jewelry store and they said, hey, do me a favor. Watch the store for a few minutes while I go to the bank and make a deposit. The phone hasn't rang all day, but if it does, just answer it and do the best that you can. So you say yes, he leaves you alone with a million dollars worth of jewelry and the phone. Suddenly the phone rings, so you answer it and a nice young man on the other end on the phone asks, how much are your diamond rings? What do you say? At this point, you have no useful information for him because you know nothing about diamonds. But can you think of some questions to ask? How about, sir, what size diamond are you looking for? Is it for a woman or a man? What type of cut do you want? What type of setting do you want? Do you need the ring by a certain date? Would you like the ring delivered or would you prefer to pick it up? Sir, do you have a budget in mind for the ring? That wasn't so hard, was it? In fact, there's probably many more questions that you can think of off the top of your head. So why is it when somebody asks us how much we charge for one of our products or services, we break into a cold sweat and our stomach starts to churn? Why do we feel that we need to give them some sort of solid answer before we have additional information? The biggest mistake that most business people make is they try to sell every single product they have when on the phone, and as a result, they never find out what the customer really wants. Price is usually a part of the conversation, but rarely is it the deciding factor as to whether a prospect will come to you and do business with you. So if price isn't going to be part of the deciding factor for them, then don't make it a stumbling block. Your ability to discuss pricing confidently is directly related to your strength and belief in yourself and your products. If you don't have the faith that your products and services are worth every penny, you will not be able to sell. Here's some quick hitting concepts that you should remember about your initial contact with prospects, whether it be in person or on the phone. Number one, always speak with a clear and professional voice. Show confidence in yourself, your prices, and your sales system. 
If you sound and act confident, this will rub off on your prospect and they will turn into a customer very quickly. Number two, when asked about your prices, don't give specifics, give ranges. Once you have qualified your prospect and you know what it is they're exactly looking for, it will become easier to give them specific prices, but to begin with, you need to just give ranges. It doesn't matter what industry you're in, this technique works for them all. Number three, planting the what I call the seeds of money with everything that you say is a big part of an emotionally driven sales process. Number four, use qualifying questions to establish the needs, the budgets, and the desires of your prospect. And number five, Accept the fact that not everybody is meant to be your customer. Once you have a solid idea about what a prospect is looking for, if you don't feel they fit into your overall game plan, it's okay to send them down the road to somebody else. Not everyone is meant to be your customer. It is okay to say no. Let's take some time right now to do what I call the ping pong exercise, which will give you a firm grasp on how to handle initial contacts on the phone or in person. The initial conversation is usually just like a tennis match or a ping pong game with several volleys back and forth. This exercise is intended to begin for you the process of creating powerful scripts that will be in your brain that you can use anytime, anywhere. I'm going to give you some examples of statements that prospects all over the world seem to ask over the phone. And I want you to write down how you would respond to each one. This will be the beginning of your script. Now, I highly recommend you come back to this exercise later on today and give it some more thought. But for right now, go ahead, jot down some short answers. Ready? Number one, how much are your blue widgets? Can you mail me some information? I'll think about it and call you back later. The guy down the street is a lot less than you are. Wow, your prices are the most expensive I've ever heard. Now, you may have encountered other questions or stalls other than the ones I've mentioned here. So take a minute and write those down, then note how you will respond. Now we're gonna switch gears. I want you to make a list of questions that you will ask. And here's some ideas just to get you started. How did you happen to hear about us? Do you have a budget for your blue widget? Would you consider getting a package of blue widgets if the price was right? When are you looking to make your final decision? And what will you be using your blue widget for? Now I hope this exercise gets your creative mojo working and starts you thinking about how you can deal with prospects on the phone or in person. Thinking along these lines will help you access information about what the customer is actually looking for and will get them talking about themselves, which keeps things on an emotional level. The more you can get them to talk, the more emotionally attracted they will become to you. Again, we're in the business of selling emotion. If you can do that, the sale will follow. God gave you two ears and one mouth for a very distinctive reason. Once a sale is made, there's a couple of other things that you can do to continue to build your relationship. Write a thank you note within 24 hours after the customer makes their purchase or just a quick phone call 24 hours after just to touch bases to see how things are going. Are your competitors doing this? Do you want to swim in a red ocean with everyone else, all fighting over the same customers with the same products and services? Or do you want to create that blue ocean where you are the only swimmer in the sea? In the end, people won't remember what you did or what you said. They will remember how you made them feel. Passion is the fulcrum point of all sales. If you show passion during your relationship with your customers, that emotion will transfer to them and will create a desire in their hearts to buy. Passion is an emotional feeling that is like the mumps. <laughs> it's very contagious. Remember back when you were a kid riding around all summer on your bike without a care in the world? Nothing bothered you and life was good. You probably even had a family-run pizza joint down at the corner just like I did. I can remember on Friday nights how my entire family would all meet down there at the dinner time to enjoy a slab of pizza, some sodas, and pinball. And that was my favorite part when my mom gave me a stack of quarters so I could play the pinball machines in between slices. If I ran out, she always seemed to have more. Moms are always good for change, you know. There was an endless supply of quarters coming from the bottom of my mom's purse. At least it seemed that way. And looking back, I can see that it wasn't necessarily the pizza that got my attention. It was the pinball. That was something that benefited me directly, and I was thoroughly enjoying my time on the flippers. The feature, so to speak, was the pizza. The benefit 
was the pinball. Now that I'm a big kid, I don't get to ride around on my bike all summer and I sure don't get to play pinball very often. But I do understand the value of features and benefits and how they play an integral role in the sales process. All products and services have features and benefits, but it's the benefits that motivate people to act and to buy. Think about it. Why did you purchase your last car? It probably had all sorts of cool features and modern amenities, but when it came down to it, the benefits of those features are what got you nailed down. It had anti-lock brakes, which would keep the kids safe on those rainy nights. It had a DVD player, which made it convenient to travel with young children on long trips. It had an extra large cargo space, which meant that everybody in the family could put their suitcase in. It had a surround sound speaker system, which meant everyone could enjoy their music. You didn't buy the DVD player or the moonroof or the six cylinder engine or the speaker system. You bought the benefits and the value that those things brought to your life. Let's take this a bit further. What about the features and benefits of a ballpoint pen? Feature, it has a clicker at the end that retracts the tip. The benefit of that, you won't accidentally get ink all over your shirt. The feature is it has black ink. The benefit, you can sign all your legal documents with it. The feature, it has a metal clip on the side so you can put it in your shirt. The benefit of that is it won't fall out when you bend over. How about a cup of coffee? Feature, it has a handle on the side. The benefit of that, if you're drinking something hot, you won't burn your hands. Feature, it holds eight ounces of fluid. The benefit, the contents won't get cold before you have a chance to drink it all. Feature, it's white. The benefit of it being white, it will go with just about any color you have on your table. Now, take your products and services and develop a list of features and benefits. This alone will make you a powerhouse to be reckoned with. For all the listeners of Business Edge Radio, I have a special gift for you. I want to give you a free copy of my book, High Voltage Branding, Go From Ordinary to Extraordinary, as my way of saying thank you for being a loyal listener. The book covers the most important elements of how to develop a great brand, build a loyal fan base for your products and services, and ways to identify if your brand is broke. Whether you're an old timer or have a new business venture, having an impeccable brand is vital to your success. And this book will give you lots to think about. Simply go to powermarketing101.com slash free book. That's powermarketing101.com slash free book to download your free copy of the book High Voltage Branding. Go from ordinary to extraordinary as my special way of saying thanks for being a fan of the show. This episode is being brought to you by the School of Hard Knocks. If you're anything like me, you know many people who have wounds and scars from battles won and lost in their life. We've all heard it said before that, oh, he or she is a student at the School of Hard Knocks, or the best lessons I've ever learned are from the School of Hard Knocks. Well, this prestigious university has some of the best alumni in the entire world, and the curriculum is more difficult than Stanford Medical School. You can't apply for admission, and you don't get to pick your classes. We all know that special person who always seems to be hit with adversity and obstacles, but always comes out the other end with a smile. Now, there's a special gift that is unlike anything they've ever received. As we all know, the School of Hard Knocks has one of the most difficult curriculum of any school in the world, and you now can give the gift of a PhD from this prestigious university. This authentic-looking diploma is printed on the same high-quality paper that the top schools in the world use for their diplomas and comes with an official gold foil seal that will look great framed in any room. Signed by both the president of Perpetual Hard Knocks as well as the dean of adversity, this PhD degree will light up any room and become the center of conversation. The diploma reads, PhD in street smarts and learning the hard way with a minor in picking yourself up by the bootstraps. This hard-fought degree is indeed a gift that money cannot buy. Get one for your spouse, for your boss, your parent, your best friend. Give them the gift that money can't buy today. For a limited time, when you place your order at www.schoolofhardknocks.net, you'll receive a special Business Edge Radio discount of 20% at checkout when you enter the code word EDGE. Once again, 20% off your first order when you use the code EDGE at checkout. 
And to sweeten the pot just a little bit more, I'm also going to include a complimentary digital copy of High Voltage Branding, Go From Ordinary to Extraordinary, as my gift to you. www.schoolofhardknocks.net That's www.schoolofhardknocks.net Get one for that person in your life who seems to have everything, or heck, get one for yourself. You've earned it! Hi there! This is Mitch Graff, the host of Business Edge Radio. Would you do me a couple of very big favors? First, I invite you to subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes. This will help other forward thinkers just like you discover the show. Second, I ask that you share this show on your social media platforms. And third, I would love it if you connected with us on social at Unleashed Tribe on Facebook and Instagram, or log on to PowerMarketing101.com to find more great resources. If you could do this for me, you would be a superhero in my book, and I would be eternally grateful. I bet you have some incredible stories about great customer service you've gotten, and also stories of terrible service you've received over the years. Fans, I have a special invitation for you. I am currently writing a new book titled Customer Service is Dead, giving six-star service in a one-star world that will be released later this year. What I'm looking for are your stories and examples of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And if your story is chosen for publication, you will receive a copy from the first printing, as well as your story being read on the air on a future show. Simply send us your story of no more than 500 words to info at powermarketing101.com. That's info at powermarketing101.com by July 31st. And hopefully your story makes it in my new book, Customer Service is Dead, giving six-star service in a one-star world. Have fun with it, make it entertaining, and give me your good, bad, and ugly stories about customer service you've received. Give me your best shot and make me proud. Happiness. It's something we all strive for, but at times it seems almost too elusive and out of range for many people. Today, I want to take a look at a book by a cellular genetic scientist named Matthew Ricard, who 50 years ago left his career and France and became a Buddhist monk in the Himalayas. He's a best-selling author, a translator, a great photographer, and an active participant in the scientific research involved on the effects of meditation on the brain. He's been called the happiest person in the world by media, and our book today is simply called Happiness, A Guide to Developing Life's Most Important Skill. Happiness is that feeling that comes over you when you know life is good and you can't help but smile. It's the opposite of sadness. Happiness is a sense of well-being, of joy, of contentment. When people are successful or safe or lucky, they feel happy. For millennia, philosophers, writers, and artists have sought the key to human happiness. Ricard offers his own musings about the nature of happiness and tips on how to attain it in this book. It can't be found in fleeting experiences of pleasure, the joy of a sunny day, the refreshing taste of an ice cream cone, but only in the depths of an individual's being. Happiness is not self-interested, but rather it's compassionate, seeking the well-being of others. If we are truly happy, writes Ricard, we can change the world because our compassion for others and our desire to end hatred and bring happiness even to those we don't like is what it's all about. For Ricard, happiness is a deep state of well-being and wisdom that flourishes in moments of our life despite the inevitability of suffering. Individuals can, however, learn to minimize suffering in life by practicing moderation in all things, as well as meditation. And there's actually meditative exercises at the beginning of each chapter. He writes, By happiness, I mean here the deep sense of flourishing that arises from an exceptionally healthy mind. This is not a mere pleasurable feeling, a fleeting emotion or a mood, but an optimal state of being. Happiness is also a way of interpreting the world, since while it may be difficult to change the world, it is always possible to change the way we look at it. In Buddhism, sukha, or happiness, is a state of lasting well-being that unfolds when we have overcome mental blindness and afflicted emotions. The happiest people Ricard has met are Tibetan seers who have tamed their egos through mind-training exercises 
and are able to approach every person and every situation with natural ease, benevolence, fortitude, and serenity. The author also examines how thoughts such as desire, hatred, and envy become our own worst enemies. Hitting high stride in the closing chapters, Ricard discusses the connections between happiness, kindness, humility, optimism, going through the flow of time, and of course, facing death. I think there are so many golden nuggets in this book that can give you a renewed sense of what is truly important in your life and may even give you a chance to take a deep breath and slow your life down just a little bit. You can find this book along with many other great reads at powermarketing101.com slash hotlist. That's powermarketing101.com slash hotlist. Here's my email address. Here's the email. Email. We get your mail. We get your mail. Let's dive in to Mitch's mailbag and answer some of your burning questions. Okay, our letters today come from far and wide, which makes my heart warm and my inbox full. (laughs) Our first email comes from Timothy in Port Angeles, Washington. He asks, when is the right time to raise prices? My mother owns a sewing shop and hasn't raised her prices since she opened over 10 years ago. She always seems to be fairly busy and makes her living from the store. Well, Timothy, two thoughts for you and your mom. First of all, The old saying that if it ain't broke, don't fix it may apply here to a limited extent. If she pays all her bills, pays herself enough to buy whatever lifestyle she wants, then an argument can be made to let it be. But, and it is a big but, I can probably bet you all the money in the world that her expenses have went up over the last 10 years, right? Her rent's gone up. She probably pays more for her supplies and products than she used to pay. She has to buy shoes and clothes and a loaf of bread to eat at the store. My rule of thumb for retail is to raise prices once a year based on supply and demand and based on your cost for doing business. It sounds like she is in demand. So raising her prices, let's say 5%, probably won't make an iota of difference to her customers, but it will add 5% more to the bottom line to her pocketbook. She may be able to raise prices 10% if her prices are already low. And then the thing is, she may lose a customer or two, but she will make more money for less work, which is always a good thing. Timothy, I would be very interested in talking with your mom to find out more about her reasons why she hasn't wanted to raise her prices. We all have to pay more for everything in our lives. Uh, I just got an email yesterday from my trash service saying they're raising prices August 1st. And as they put it, to keep up with the growing expenses of doing business. (laughs) Price increases are just part of life, and hopefully you can convince her to make that adjustment. Thanks for the email, Timothy. Next, Julie in Hamilton, Montana writes, Thanks for bringing such great content to my ears every week, Mitch. I'm getting tons out of your show. Well, thank you very much, Julie. I have a small lawn care business, my first business. Good for you. Congratulations. That employs about four to five high school kids each summer. This year, I've lost about a third of my clients, but want to still keep my kids employed. They're all great kids and do a great job for me. Well, Julie, I admire your desire to want to keep all of your teenagers working, but this may require you to tighten up your belt more than what I'm sensing you are wanting or willing to do right now. Anybody that employs people knows the anguish that you are probably feeling. After all, They depend on you for some income. But something to remember is that although it's admirable to want to keep the kids working, you have to take an overhead view of your business and see if it really makes sense to keep them all on board. If you depend on the business for your livelihood, then it needs to take precedence over keeping some spending money in the pockets of the high school kids. As our businesses grow, we learn to delegate our duties and offload things and we hire and we minimize our workload so that we can free up our time to invest it into other activities that grow our businesses, not just maintain it. So I assume that when you started, you did the work yourself until you got to the point of critical mass that you decided to start hiring your first employees. Well, Julie, you may need to jump back in with both feet for a while until you can get through this little hitch in our giddy up. You sound like a wonderful boss, and I wish I had you around when I was in high school. 
I know it's a difficult time, but your main job is to make sure your business survives and your business is profitable. And that's still around in six months, 12 months, five years. Yes, providing jobs for your local community is also something that many of us can understand, but that really is secondary to assuring you're around next summer to provide your services to the people of Hamilton. Maybe you can rotate the kids that work with you on jobs just to keep them involved. I admire what you're trying to do. I really, really do. Thanks for the note, Julie. And let us know how things go. Our last email today comes from Jaden in Buffalo, New York. Mitch, I am opening a nail salon in a few months, but don't know graphic designers. Who do you recommend I go through to get my signs designed and my menu designed? Well, first of all, congratulations. And great question, Jaden. And you really have many, many choices on this. My first suggestion, and this is always my first suggestion, contact your local Chamber of Commerce and see who they might have as members that can help you out. First of all, if you haven't joined your local chamber, and this is for everybody listening, that's one of the first things that you need to do as a new business. Even if you're an old business, you need to join your local chamber of commerce. That way you can keep your dollars local and it will support a local family who is in the same boat as you are. So that's your first stop. Beyond that, you can try a company called Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R.com where you can find a great array of talented artists from all over the world for a pretty reasonable price. But my first suggestion is to get in touch with some of your local talent. Who knows? Maybe they'll be interested in training services. Hmm, there's an idea. (laughs) Julie, thanks for reaching out and good luck with your new venture. It's very exciting. If you have a question for me, Send it to info at powermarketing101.com. That's info at powermarketing101.com. And maybe, just maybe, I'll read your question on the air. Hi there. This is Mitch Graff, the host of Business Edge Radio. Would you do me a couple of very big favors? First, I invite you to subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes. This will help other forward thinkers just like you discover the show. Second, I ask that you share the show on your social media platforms. And third, I would love it if you connect with us on social at Unleashed Tribe on Facebook and Instagram, or log on to PowerMarketing101.com to find more great resources. If you could do this for me, you would be a superhero in my book, and I would be eternally grateful. I bet you have some incredible stories about great customer service you've gotten and also stories of terrible service you've received over the years. Fans, I have a special invitation for you. I am currently writing a new book titled Customer Service is Dead, giving six-star service in a one-star world that will be released later this year. What I'm looking for are your stories and examples of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And if your story is chosen for publication, you will receive a copy from the first printing, as well as your story being read on the air on a future show. Simply send us your story of no more than 500 words to info at powermarketing101.com. That's info at powermarketing101.com by July 31st. And hopefully your story makes it in my new book, Customer Service is Dead, giving six-star service in a one-star world. Have fun with it, make it entertaining, and give me your good, bad, and ugly stories about customer service you've received. Give me your best shot and make me proud. In today's business world, it is vitally important that you understand what I call the seven pillars of business success, which are lifestyle design, time management, branding, sales, marketing, pricing, and social media. Regardless of what industry you're in and whether you have a brick and mortar or you're only online, having a solid foundation in these skill sets will set you up for success down the road. And to personally help you with your journey, I've come out with the Business Edge podcast, which you're listening to right this second. And I've also written a book that I can highly recommend called Business Basics Bootcamp, The Ultimate Crash Course. 
now available on Amazon.com and will give you the 30,000 foot view of all these topics and many, many more. You know, reading is something that is slowly being replaced by videos and audio books or just scrolling through your newsfeed on social media. But I've always found reading to be kind of an escape from whatever is happening in the world. This book will help you slow down just a little bit so you can get your business house in order, so to speak, and get your creative juices a flowing. Log on to Amazon.com today and get your copy of Business Basics Bootcamp, The Ultimate Crash Course. You can search my name, Mitch Graff, or search the title of the book. In the dog-eat-dog world of business success, the weak will perish and the strong will survive. Which will you be? For all the listeners of Business Edge Radio, I have a special gift for you. I want to give you a free copy of my book, High Voltage Branding. Go from ordinary to extraordinary as my way of saying thank you for being a loyal listener. The book covers the most important elements of how to develop a great brand, build a loyal fan base for your products and services, and ways to identify if your brand is broke. Whether you're an old timer or have a new business venture, having an impeccable brand is vital to your success. And this book will give you lots to think about. Simply go to powermarketing101.com slash free book. That's powermarketing101.com slash free book to download your free copy of the book High Voltage Branding. Go from ordinary to extraordinary as my special way of saying thanks for being a fan of the show. Now, it's time for stories from the field. The great, the good, and the terrible. Losing a favorite toy feels devastating to a young kid. Longtime Lego fan Luca Apps spent all of his Christmas money on a Ninjago, which is a Lego ninja, named JXZ. Against his dad's advisement, he brought his Ninjago on a shopping trip. You can tell what's going to happen. <laughs> he lost it. Luca wrote a letter to Lego explaining his loss and assuring the Lego staff that he would take extra special care of his action figure if they would send him another one. <laughs> Hello, my name is Luca Apps and I'm seven years old. With all my money I got for Christmas, I bought the Ninjago kit of the Ultrasonic Raider. The number is 9449. It's really good. <laughs> My daddy just took me to Sainsbury and told me to leave the people at home, but I took them with me and I lost JXZ at the shop as it fell out of my coat. I am really upset. <laughs> I have lost him. Daddy said to send you an email and ask if you would send me another one. I promise I won't take him to the shop again if you can. <laughs> Signed, Luca. The response he received from LEGO customer support representative Richard was nothing short of amazing. Richard told Luke that he had talked to Sensei Wu, which is a Ninjago character, writing, He told me to tell you, Luca, your father seems like a very wise man. You must always protect your Ninjago minifigures like the dragons protect the weapons of Spinjitsu. Sensei Wu also told me it was okay if I sent you a new J and told me it would be okay if I included something extra for you because anyone that saves their Christmas money to buy the Ultrasonic Raider must be a really big Ninjago fan. So I hope you enjoy your J minifigure with all his weapons. You actually have the only J minifigure that combines three different J's into one. I am also going to send you a bad guy for him to fight. <laughs> Just remember what Sensei Wu said. Keep your minifigures protected like the weapons of Spinjitsu. And of course, always listen to your dad. <laughs> it's so rare to see such a thoughtful, creative response to a distraught customer. This story definitely went viral all over the news. All right. An elderly man, 89 years old, was snowed in at his Pennsylvania home around the holidays. And his daughter was worried that he wasn't going to have access to enough food due to the impending storm and the bad weather in the area. After calling multiple stores in a desperate attempt to find anyone who would deliver to her father's home, she finally got a hold of someone at Trader Joe's who told her that they also do not deliver normally. Given the extreme circumstance, they told her they would be glad to deliver directly to his home 
and even suggested additional delivery items that would fit perfectly with his special low sodium diet. After the daughter placed the order for the food, the employee on the phone told her that she didn't need to worry about the price, the food would be delivered free of charge. The employee then wished her a Merry Christmas. Less than 30 minutes later, the food was at the man's doorstep for free. In refusing to let the red tape get in the way of the customer in need, Trader Joe's shows that customer service doesn't need to be about the fanfare. It can simply be about doing the right thing. The Ritz-Carlton is one of those few large companies that is held in high standards from their customers. With an almost legendary reputation for service, you have to wonder, do they really live up to the hype? Well, the story of Joshi the Giraffe certainly presents a compelling case for, yes, <laughs> they do. The story begins when a customer, Chris Hearn's son, left his favorite stuffed giraffe, Joshi, in the hotel room after a stay. Mr. Hearn assured his distraught son that Joshi was just staying a few extra days on vacation. He then called the staff at the Ritz and relayed the story he had told his son. In an all-star effort to make everything right for their customer, the staff at the Ritz-Carlton created a series of photographs that included all the activities Joshi had been involved in during his extended vacation. First things first, they knew Joshi couldn't just be aimlessly wandering around the Ritz without a staff card, so they made him one. After that, Joshi headed over to the pool to relax. Not one to sit around and do nothing, Joshi helped out in the loss prevention department. Joshi then decided to melt away some stress with a spa day. And to top it all off, the Ritz sent Hearn and his son a booklet filled with information about Joshi's stay as well as a host of pictures showing what a great time he had. Man, what a wonderful story. I'm feeling like only sharing the good, happy stories of impeccable service today, so you're going to have to wait for the next batch of terrible customer service stories. It just feels like one of those great days. Hi there. This is Mitch Graff, the host of Business Edge Radio. Would you do me a couple of very big favors? First, I invite you to subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes. This will help other forward thinkers just like you discover the show. Second, I ask that you share this show on your social media platforms. And third, I would love it if you connected with us on social at Unleashed Tribe on Facebook and Instagram, or log on to powermarketing101.com to find more great resources. If you could do this for me, you would be a superhero in my book, and I would be eternally grateful. In today's business world, it is vitally important that you understand what I call the seven pillars of business success, which are lifestyle design, time management, branding, sales, marketing, pricing, and social media. Regardless of what industry you're in and whether you have a brick and mortar or you're only online, having a solid foundation in these skill sets will set you up for success down the road. And to personally help you with your journey, I've come out with the Business Edge podcast, which you're listening to right this second. And I've also written a book that I can highly recommend called Business Basics Bootcamp, The Ultimate Crash Course, now available on Amazon.com and will give you the 30,000 foot view of all these topics and many, many more. You know, reading is something that is slowly being replaced by videos and audiobooks or just scrolling through your newsfeed on social media. But I've always found reading to be kind of an escape from whatever is happening in the world. This book will help you slow down just a little bit so you can get your business house in order, so to speak, and get your creative juices a flowing. Log on to Amazon.com today and get your copy of Business Basics Bootcamp, The Ultimate Crash Course. You can search my name, Mitch Graff, or search the title of the book. In the dog-eat-dog -dog world of business success, the weak will perish and the strong will survive. Which will you be? For all the listeners of Business Edge Radio, I have a special gift for you. I want to give you a free copy of my book, High Voltage Branding. Go from ordinary to extraordinary as my way of saying thank you for being a loyal listener. The book covers the most important elements of how to develop a great brand, build a loyal fan base for your products and services, and ways to identify if your brand is broke. 
Whether you're an old timer or have a new business venture, having an impeccable brand is vital to your success. And this book will give you lots to think about. Simply go to powermarketing101.com slash free book. That's powermarketing101.com slash free book to download your free copy of the book, High Voltage Branding, Go From Ordinary to Extraordinary, as my special way of saying thanks for being a fan of the show. Time for Cooking Corner with Mitch. Yum! There's only a few rules of cooking in my kitchen. Rule number one. All ingredient amounts can be adjusted up or down based on how much you love or dislike something. If you like pineapple, add a little bit more. If you don't like mushrooms, leave them out. I call it the ish principle. Add a cup of cheese. Ish. More if you like it, less if you don't. Rule number two. There's no rules to what combination of ingredients that you can use in your recipes. It's like when my kids say they don't want to try peanut butter pizza. And I say, well, do you like peanut butter? Yeah. Do you like pizza? Yeah. So why wouldn't you like peanut butter pizza? (laughs) At least it makes sense to me. It's okay to let your creative juices flow when you're in the kitchen. Rule number three, cooking is meant to be enjoyed by the entire family. So get your kids involved with preparing courses for tonight's dinner. Turn some of their favorite music on and start cooking away. Just this week, we had a daddy kid dinner night with my kids and they all prepared something delicious. My 15 year old daughter, made a tasty cucumber avocado tomato salad. Very nice. My 13-year-old son made handmade fried raviolis in a vegetable red sauce using vegetables from the garden. And my six-year-old made blueberry jello with blueberries inside. (laughs) All recipes that they made up as they went. And rule number four, always, and I do mean always, make sure you have a nice beverage of some sort nearby and you have some good music playing in the background makes for a fun time for all. Check out this recipe for today. You can use it on top of your eggs in the morning, on your steak or grilled chicken at night, in a salad, as a side dish with crackers, or just by the spoonful like I tend to do at times. Today we're making chunky mango salsa. And this time of year, it's easy to find fresh, juicy mangoes at your local market. Mango is a juicy stone fruit produced from numerous species of tropical trees, and the genus actually belongs to the cashew family. Mangoes are native to South Asia, from where the common mango or Indian mango has been distributed worldwide to become one of the most widely cultivated fruits in the tropics. Mango trees can grow to 130 feet tall with a radius of over 30 feet. And the trees are also very long lived as some specimens still fruit after 300 years. Ripe intact mangoes give off a very distinctive sweet smell, so you want to make sure you give them a little squeeze and a smell before deciding which ones to get. All right, to start, you need about four cups of fresh mango that you get at the store or four cups of frozen cubes that you can also buy from your freezer section. You want the chunks to be about a quarter inch across. In a bowl, add your mango, one bunch of chopped cilantro, about a tablespoon of granulated sugar, Just add a little more sweetness to the recipe in case your mangoes are a bit tart for your taste. One medium red onion, or a sweet onion if you prefer. The juice of four fresh limes, which is approximately six to eight tablespoons of juice if you want to use the bottle product. And if you want to bring a little heat to the party, a quarter cup of diced seeded jalapenos. If you really like your heat, try a habanero instead. Go ahead, I dare you. (laughs) Mix it all together, stick it in the fridge to cool it down for at least an hour. That also gives all the ingredients plenty of time to get happy. And then you're ready to enjoy a spoonful of chunky mango salsa. You really can use this as a compliment for just about any dish. So give it a try and let me know how this one turns out. Well, that will do it for this edition of Business Edge Radio. And my parting shot today is this. Build your own dreams or someone will hire you to build theirs. Farrah Gray. Until next time, this is Mitch Graff reminding you to live with passion. I'll catch you later.
Thanks for hanging out with Business Edge Radio. If you enjoyed today's show, we invite you to subscribe, rate, and review. Then hop on over to www.mitchcraft.com to get even more meat and potatoes. We also invite you to follow the show at facebook.com slash unleashed tribe. The most valuable asset that any of us has is our time. And we thank you for choosing to spend some of your precious time with us. 